Okay, here we go. Dune Steve in three, two, one. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Fish Trout Sealed and Big Anklevich. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I am Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Fout. I'm... I'm not sure who I am today, sir. Fish Troutfield? Fish Troutfield, yes. <laughs> I'm your co-host, Rish, and I am tired of podcasting already. All right. Well, uh, in, in, if that is the case, then we will hurry along to our story so that you can have a good long break. Because that's what we do when we podcast. We just sit and listen to the story with you. We don't do anything in between. We don't just go right into the uh, part that comes after and then edit it with the magic of television. We listen, too. We used to do that when other people would produce for us. Uh, We would hold off on listening to the finished product until we were recording. Or maybe I'm imagining that because, boy, that would waste a lot of recording (laughs) space. We probably stopped the recording, listened, and then started another one. Ah, that okay. would make more sense. Although making sense is not usually our strong point. No, nor is making podcasts. <laughs> True enough. Oh my gosh. What? Uh, what? Just, you, everything all right? The flying tarantula season out again? I, I, I feel just like got, it was just three months ago. I just got shat upon by a bird or something. I had the windows rolled down. Because it was hot when we made the last show. And so I rolled them down and I had my hand just kind of sitting out the window. And a little drop of something landed on my wrist and it's like yellow. It looks like I got got mustard squirted on me. There's nothing here. It had to have been some bird flying overhead or something. That ain't mustard. And uh, yeah, uh, the irony is we're about to run a story called What You Deserve. (laughs) <laughs> yep, I, and and it and it's probably Christmas Eve when this uh, is coming out. So <laughs> I'm getting what I deserve on Christmas Eve. <sighs> so this story, what you deserve, uh, was written by Mr. Rish Outfield. It's not short, so I guess we should uh, let them uh, let them listen. Yeah. They know the author already, so we don't need to have an announcer man say... About the author. Right, that. So uh, we'll we'll skip that and just go on into the story. And we'll talk more about it on the other side. Deal. What You Deserve by Rish Outfield It just isn't fair, Luke Skywalker. 1977. Douglas Malone was going to be late. He glanced down at the dashboard. Scratch that. He was already late. He was late because he was assistant manager at the office supply store right off University Parkway. You know the one. And Evelyn, the other AM, that he sort of liked, hadn't shown up for work. On Christmas Eve. And that meant Douglas had to cover her shift. Even though he'd shown up at 5.45 that morning to work his own shift. Evelyn had gotten an interview over at Costco last week. And it must have gone well because she hadn't called, hadn't texted, and hadn't come in to do her job. Presumably because she was quitting. Evelyn hated the boss, Simon, spelled with a Y instead of an I even though he'd been born with it spelled the right way. So that probably contributed. Douglas had his issues with the boss, too, but had nowhere else to go. He had gone to school to be an artist, and he was good, but was thus far completely unsuccessful. He was born to do rock and roll album covers, but had been born 30 years too late. Right now, 
the only place his sprawling vistas, demons, wizards, sea monsters, and scantily clad warriors could find a home would be on the covers of fantasy novels or magazines, if those even still existed. He had sent samples of his work to various publishing houses, and even gotten an encouraging email from Tor. But that was a year ago, and it looked like his job at the office supply place was as good as it got. Great. And where it had got him was in his car, on his way to his sister's house for the holidays, so far behind that he wouldn't see his nephews till the next morning. Right now, he was driving through rural California, trying to stay awake. His coffee thermos was dry, and hoping to find something other than Christmas music on the radio. Oldies, country, rock, even the Spanish station, all had holiday tunes playing. Ironically, the only one not belting out tired Yule standards was the gospel station, and that had an inexplicably southern-sounding preacher ranting scarily about commercialism and the greatest gift. He hadn't planned on spending Christmas with his sister and her family, but he and his girlfriend had broken up on Halloween. Romantic, yes? And his Jewish roommate Keith was a bear to be around during the holidays. At least there would be roast beef and potatoes at his sister's place, and the rambunctious twin nephews that loved him, which should more than make up for the long drive and the inevitable tirades about politics from his brother-in-law, Gino. He just wished he were there already. He was tired, cranky, and feeling pretty down on himself. Plus, he kept shifting uncomfortably on the seat. He hoped it was nothing, but... He suspected he'd soon be dealing with what the commercials called hemorrhoidal flare-up. Fantastic. That sort of thing wasn't being mentioned in any of the Christmas songs he kept finding on the radio. He decided he would get off the freeway and get some coffee, maybe get rid of what was left of the last two cups he'd drank, and get a little fresh air. he just missed an exit, but there was another one about a mile or so ahead. Douglas signaled and got into the right lane. Already the traffic had been thinning, as most travelers were cozy in front of a fire or a television showing old Charlie Brown specials. Slowing down, Douglas noticed a car in the breakdown lane up ahead. It was a beat-up gray van, the hood up, and the emergency flashers on. He slowed more, and as he drove past, saw an old man standing in front of the vehicle, staring down at his phone. The expression on the man's face was not a pleasant one. That was too bad. Douglas was having a bad night, but this dude seemed to be having a badder one. As he neared the exit, he glanced in the rearview mirror and saw only the headlights and emergency flashers of the van, not the old guy with that look on his face. That look had been despair. Somebody else will come along he thought aloud, trying to convince himself, apparently. It preyed on Douglas as he signaled, slowed again, and pulled off the freeway. There was a lit-up gas station just a block away, but damn, that old man's face. Some kind of frustration, some kind of fear, some kind of hopelessness. It just sucked to see it. How much more would it suck to feel it? Oh, boy, Douglas said, as instead of turning right to get his fresh air and, preferably, fresh coffee, he turned left, went under the overpass, and got back on the freeway, heading south back the way he had come. He didn't know why he was doing it, except, hey, maybe the Christmas songs had gotten to him. I can't really stay, it's cold outside, and... And Mom and Dad can hardly wait for school to start again, notwithstanding. He drove the three miles, having misjudged the distance, obviously, to the next exit south, then turned left again and got right back on the freeway, coming north again. Somebody else will have come along, he thought aloud, and I'm going to feel pretty stupid. But nobody else had come along. The van was still there. Lights flashing, and he pulled up right behind it, looking for the old guy. He had gotten back in the van, and seeing Douglas approach, all but fell over himself getting out and flagging him down. 
Hey there! Douglas killed the engine and stepped out of his car. He could smell something foul coming from under the hood of the other vehicle. Burning oil, or worse. The old man, maybe not as old as he'd seemed, but with enormous eyebrows like somebody on a Star Trek rerun, met him in the glow of Douglas's headlights. He swallowed before saying, Thank you for stopping. Evening, Douglas said. You in trouble? I... The man began. Then his voice failed him. That look showed up again. You could say that. I'd been having problems with the carburetor, but I think it's worse than that. Won't start. It tries, but it makes this sound. He trailed off. Douglas thought the man would start crying, right there in front of a stranger. Sorry. You call a tow truck? I can't get a signal. I don't know what it is. Cheap phone, maybe. Douglas nodded and reached for his own phone. He didn't have it on him. It was inside the car, charging. I can grab mine. What's your name? asked the man as Douglas turned. Doug. Doug, I'm Gerald. I... I... Again, he trailed off. Douglas waited. My wife and I were headed to Leah's Landing. Do you know it? No, I'm not from around here. It's less than an hour from us. Just north fifty or so miles. Douglas nodded, hesitantly. This sounded awfully specific to be telling an unfamiliar person who was about to call a tow truck for the guy. My wife is very sick. She... She needs to get to Leah's landing tonight. I'm sorry, but I can't imagine there's not a mechanic around here that could at least get you off the side of the... Doug, the old man said, stepping close. That look was growing on his face again, and for a moment, Douglas wondered if there was even a wife in the van at all, if this wasn't some crazy guy who'd been kicked in the face by life once too many times, and had just snapped. I... Feel terrible for asking you this, but I really need to get my wife to Leah's Landing before midnight. Douglas stood, frozen, listening. He knew where the old man was going with this, but he was going to make him say it anyway. Gerald licked his lips. I'm wondering if you could please... See it in your heart to getting us there before it's too late. There it was. Driving you, you mean. I know it's a lot to ask a stranger, but I'm not exaggerating when I say it's a matter of life and death. He didn't look like he was exaggerating. What's wrong? She's got cancer. My wife, Samantha. Inoperable, I'm afraid. Just a matter of time. I'm sorry, he mumbled, though he wasn't sure if he meant, I'm sorry your wife is dying, or, I'm sorry I can't help you. Gerald continued, But if I get her to Leah's Landing, California, tonight, I'm pretty sure. Emotion hit the huge eyebrowed man, like a punch to the chest. Pretty sure she'll be all right, he managed. Douglas nodded politely. It's Christmas Eve, he said, as if that was all he needed to say. Hopefully it would be. That's why it has to be tonight. She can only get better on Christmas Eve. Douglas was tempted to nod again, but forced himself not to. I'm not sure what time it is, but it's at least ten. I don't think there's any way you can make it before midnight. Please, interrupted the man. We can make it, if you'll drive us. Mr. Gerald. Gerald, I can't. I've got to drive to my sister's, and that's still, like, two hours away. The big-eyebrowed man considered this. 
He looked desperate, even more than before. He made another play. Could you take us somewhere where we could hire a taxi? Where's that? I don't know. We're not from here either. Douglas thought about it. Look, I don't think a taxi will take you an hour north on Christmas Eve. Not unless you've got a ton of cash to bribe one with. I don't. I'd offer it to you, if I had. Douglas sighed. He wasn't going to do this thing, but he didn't feel right just driving away. I could drive you to a payphone, if there is one. Uh, There's a gas station at the next exit. Maybe they know a cabbie that can get you where you're going. If that's all you can do, all right. I'm sorry, he said again. Let me tell Samantha, said the unfortunate man, and turned to go back to the van. As soon as his back was turned, his posture changed. Disappointment, sadness, despair, the whole shebang. Oh, shit, Douglas whispered. And then he couldn't help himself. It was as though he were having an out-of-body experience. Gerald, he called quite independent of himself. The old man turned. Get your wife. I'll take you to Green Acres or whatever it was called. Samantha, it turned out, actually did exist, and was exactly what a dying woman was supposed to look like, which was awful. She had wasted away, barely weighed a hundred pounds, and by her stature had been a big woman once, and had a respirator tank that needed to be loaded into the car with her. Douglas's back seat had been full of bags, presents, his laptop, and several items he'd picked up at Target and never took into his apartment. They all had to be rearranged so the dying woman could be fit inside. "'You really ought to sit up front,' he heard her husband say to her. "'But there's more room back here.' "'Sorry about the mess.' Douglas said to the lady, and she only looked at him, with eyes that were drugged and distant. He didn't think she knew where she was or what was happening, maybe not even who she was anymore. Douglas glanced at the dashboard clock. It was almost eleven. He said so. I don't know if we'll get there in time. Fifty miles, you said? About fifty miles, said Gerald. He put the seatbelt around his wife and kissed her on the forehead. But we have to get there before midnight. Why is that? Does the hospital close up at... I'll explain on the way, the old man said, and closed the back seat door. Douglas glanced up at the van. You just going to leave it like that? he asked. The lights were flashing, and the passenger door was open. No time, said Gerald climbing into the front seat, where travel snacks and a backpack took up most of the butt room. Just put that on the fl- Douglas began, but the man collected it all, sat down, and put it on his lap, moving as fast as he seemed capable. Douglas ran over, closed the van's door, then climbed into his own vehicle, and following his passenger's lead, put on his seatbelt before getting back on the freeway. He signaled, and started forward, making sure no other cars were coming along to plow into them. That would be a nice touch, wouldn't it? Okay, he said, speeding up. I'm going to try to get you there, but I can't make any promises. The old man made an agreeable sound. We do what we can. Hopefully we deserve what's coming to us. Now, that was a morbid statement if Douglas had ever heard one. He inhaled slowly. It wasn't too late to pull back off the road and let these two out again. Where is this place exactly? I have a map. Oh, no. What is it? I left it in the van. Right. He looked for his phone. It had fallen down between the seats, but it was at least plugged in and fairly easy to retrieve. We can look on my phone. If there's a signal. There will be, Gerald said. 
There has to be. Well, that went without saying. But the way he said it, Douglas knew he was only getting part of the story. Okay, what's going on in this town? The one we're headed toward. Leah's Landing. I... I know this will sound strange. Looks that way, Douglas remarked. But you might as well tell me. It's an unusual town. I heard about it from my daughter-in-law's sister. Ex-daughter-in-law's sister, I suppose. There's this town in Northern California, she told me, where people get what they deserve. People what? This is how she told me, Gerald said. There is a town where, on Christmas Eve, people get exactly what they most deserve. Presents, you mean. Children get what they... Not just children. Their parents, too. Everybody in Leah's Landing gets what's coming to them every Christmas Eve. From what? From Santa? Could be. I don't know. My daughter-in-law, uh, Jessica, told me she heard about this place. Little town, off the beaten path, and the folks that live there all know about the magic of the place. But they don't talk about it. Magic, did you say? Oh, great. This was what they were talking about. How did she hear about it if they don't talk ab- Gerald nodded. Yes, I know how it sounds. The villagers aren't supposed to talk about it. That's what I mean. They try to keep it a secret, but word still gets around. It's hard to keep something like that a secret. Douglas interrupted right back. Did you say villagers? Does this town exist in the 18th century? The townsfolk, I mean, Gerald said, and actually chuckled. Anyway, the people stay on their best behavior around the holidays, because, as you do, because good folks get good things and bad folks get bad things. The people with guilty consciences tend to head out of town on the 24th of December, just in case. Why? Douglas asked. He glanced in the rearview mirror to check on the wife, but it looked like her eyes were closed tightly. Not like she was sleeping, but like she was in pain. What happens if they don't? Does Santa bring them coal? I... I don't know about that. I went on the computer to read about Leah's landing, but there aren't any stories on there about it. That were still there, I mean. Well, then how did your sister hear about it? My daughter. Well, ex-wife to my youngest son. She had read a story about it. Heard from a lady at her church. But the story was gone when she mentioned it to me. It had been removed? Douglas asked. By the government, or... They don't want it advertised. The people that live in the town. The villagers, Douglas said, and surprised himself by laughing. The idea was ridiculous, right out of a story. An old, corny story. I know how it sounds. Did he? The old man couldn't know how it sounded, or he wouldn't have said anything. He had no idea how close Douglas was to getting off the freeway once again and heading back to the broke-down van, putting this all behind him. As it stood, he'd have a pretty funny story to tell his sister when he got up there. They'd probably ask him to tell it again during dinner. Although surely someone would ask him, And what happened to the old couple? Did they get to the town? Did they get what they deserved? And what would Douglas say then? That he didn't know, but he assumed they got there on their own, or that, maybe, they never got to their destination, and the old man watched his wife sit there, in the van, as midnight ticked away on his watch. Douglas pressed the accelerator, going ten over the speed limit now. Thank you, Gerald said, and his eyes were glistening. Douglas focused on the road. On the radio, Mariah Carey was announcing what the one gift was she wanted this holiday season. Douglas turned it down. Look, we should check it out on Google Maps. What's that? It's an app on the phone that'll tell us how to get there. Oh, good. 
Good. Douglas picked up his phone, woke it up, and was about to talk into it. When the old man asked, What do you do for a living, Doug? I... I'm an artist. That was a lie. It's what Douglas was, but not what he did for a living. Ah, exciting. What kind of artist? Just a minute, Douglas said, and spoke into his phone. Driving directions to Leah's Landing, California. The phone obeyed him and told him in light traffic his destination was 41 minutes away. There, that's not so bad, Gerald said, but both of them glanced at the clock on the dash. They were cutting it close. Douglas handed the old man his phone and told him it would guide them there, tell them when to get off, etc. And where are you going once you get there? Is there a hospital? No. The computer said there are barely a thousand souls in the town. Souls? Creepy. So, is there a hotel? Do you have a reservation? I don't. I have no money, actually. Otherwise, I'd have tried to bribe you. Douglas wasn't sure whether that could have worked. It would have been better than talk of magic, though, or whatever they called it. None at all? he asked. What happened? The man furrowed that record-setting brow of his. Hospital bills wiped out everything we had. And then some. Seems likely we'll lose the house. But if Samantha makes it through, that's a small price to pay. That was optimistic, wasn't it? It didn't seem fair that medical bills could bankrupt a person, and they still weren't able to make that person better in the end. Maybe there was something to this universal health care the politicians were always talking about. But how does it work? Douglas asked, not adding, if it works. Everybody gets their miracle at midnight? From what Jessica read, it happens before midnight. To everyone. To everyone that lives there? No, everyone there at that time. At midnight. This made no sense. I know it sounds crazy, but that's how magic works. Wow. He'd actually used the word. Douglas's teeth ground together. Magic didn't work. It was made up. And in the Harry Potter movies, they at least attempted to make a certain logic of all of it. You don't believe in magic, I take it, Gerald muttered. How about miracles, then? Or just something that can't be explained? I don't know he said, and he didn't really want to talk about this anymore. He was beginning to feel stupid, stupid for taking them on this trip, stupid for listening to the story, stupid for even being in this situation and working overtime, and he didn't even get time and a half for it being Christmas Eve, according to a memo they got in October, when it wasn't his shift and he felt no loyalty to his boss. And then it occurred to him, why hadn't Simon, the manager, come in to cover his assistant manager's shift. Because he was off celebrating Christmas. Because he knew Douglas would cover it for him. Because Douglas was a sucker. He held in a sigh. Well, I hope that you get something nice tonight too, young man, Gerald said from beside him. And that too made Douglas want to slam on the brakes and go back. Wait, I'll get my just desserts too? Is that what you're saying? Just desserts. I like that. And the old man laughed. That's kind of poetic. Right. For the next twenty minutes, the old man told Douglas about his wife's cancer, about the various treatments she had undergone, the one surgery that had been scheduled, then unscheduled, and what the doctor had told him right before he had checked her out of the hospital and taken her home. Our neighbor, who is in her nineties and still goes jogging, told us to just make her comfortable and let nature take its course. He laughed again, but this was a bitter one. <laughs> comfortable, 
as if anything can make her comfortable any more. Why, she can't even talk. And the last time she spoke, you know what she said? Douglas didn't want to know. What? She said, I don't know how much more I can take. How are those for last words? Make her comfortable. This he grumbled. The old man reached into the back seat and patted his wife's bony leg. We'll show her, won't we, Sammy? Make you comfortable indeed. Right, Douglas thought, aloud this time. Douglas covered the next miles, telling Gerald about his artistic aspirations, and like the captive audience he was, the old man listened intently. He glanced nervously into the back seat. He couldn't help wonder what he was doing, and if he was driving a dead body back there, or soon would be. But he heard a rasping breath in a lull in the conversation. For now. Never give up hope. Gerald said, as though it was the first time anyone had spoken those words. You hear me? I hear you, Douglas said, distractedly. The old man also glanced in the back, then cleared his throat. Say what you mean to say, Doug. Had he even been meaning to say something else? Well, there was one thing. Have you considered that Douglas started to say, then lost his nerve. Considered what? That she's a lost cause. That's what the doctors say. No, no, he backpedaled. I mean, considered that this is a myth, a publicity thing that they made up to get people to go to their town. A tourism thing. That they keep off of the news shows and the internet. I, I just mean... I know what you mean. And yes, I have considered it. In the weeks leading up to tonight, I turned it over and over in my head. We don't have the money for this trip. To say we are broke would be sugarcoating it. But then, I heard an old John Lennon song on the radio. Douglas tried to think of which song he'd heard, and instantly, Imagine There's No Heaven... It's easy if you try, came to mind. Saying so would be in poor taste, though, so he kept it to himself. You do know who John Lennon was? Gerald asked, seemingly afraid of the answer. Sure. The original host of Wheel of Fortune, right? Before Pat Sajak? For a moment, the old man looked horrified, and Douglas quickly added, Yes, I know who John Lennon was. Go on. The man smiled, taking it in stride. Not very funny, Doug. Everybody knows Chuck Woolery was the original host of Wheel of Fortune. Who? Douglas asked. Sure, Gerald had pulled that name out of his eyebrows. So, the song, Gerald continued. Anyhow, there was one he put out when I was in college, right before the Beatles broke up. It was called Instant Karma. Like instant coffee, he had this idea that your good and bad deeds repaid you instantly, instead of throughout your life. Kind of a stupid concept, I thought at the time. But now, I can't help but wonder. Maybe this was what John Lennon was talking about. Douglas had no response to that. Anyhow, we'll see. They would, indeed. But the old man hadn't answered his question. Douglas shifted uncomfortably in his seat, considering asking the eyebrow man if he ever had problems with hemorrhoids, then again glanced in the rearview mirror at the sick woman. Her eyes were glazed over, but she was awake, seeming to follow the conversation. But what if there's no such thing as instant karma, mister? What if bad people do bad things and get away with it forever, and good people just keep on getting crapped on all their lives? He'd substituted crapped for the word he wanted to use, but the message was the same. Well, 
Samantha and I still have hope, Doug. And if that hope proves unfounded, well, let's just hope the other kind of karma still works. Douglas thought that was a terrible answer, but he kept on driving, didn't he? And that made him as gullible and or hopeful as the old man, didn't it? They drove on. After a while, he turned the radio back on, uncomfortable with the silence, which wasn't silent enough, hearing the woman's wheezing breaths in the back seat. Julie Andrews was in the middle of listing her favorite things, and even Gerald knew that that wasn't even remotely a Christmas song. And a few minutes later, the cell phone told them they'd be getting off the freeway at the next exit. He slowly made his way to the rightmost lane. Snow? A small voice spoke from the back seat. Huh? Douglas asked, craning his neck. The dying woman was gazing out the window, he thought, or perhaps just staring into space. Gerald beamed at his wife. Well, that's a good sign, don't you think? What did she say? asked Douglas. She's asking if there will be snow, the old man said quietly. Louder, he said. Not in California, dear. To Douglas, he asked, Do they ever get snow up here? I think so, just not very often. I'm not from here either he said, and for the next couple of minutes he told them his life story, at least as much as pertained to him being out there on Christmas Eve like they were. I'm sure your sister will understand, Gerald said, and left it at that. They sat in silence, the radio quietly playing its holiday favorites at sleep-inducing consistency. They left the freeway and drove through a small town that seemed to have already shut down for the night, then a winding road through orchards or vineyards. It was hard to tell at night. And then, Turn left for 1.7 miles, the phone directed him. He did so, passing a sign that announced Leah's Landing when it was a single mile away. Coming up on it now, my girl, Gerald said to his wife as cheerful as a Midwest tour guide. She said nothing, and Douglas again wondered what he would do if this, when this, didn't work. The drive back to the couple's car would be very different than the drive up here, and there was still the matter of the vans being out of commission on the side of the freeway. And then, they were at their destination. There was a welcome sign with, Enjoy your stay! written below POP-1973 and EST-1913. Douglas slowed down before driving through, glancing at the clock and seeing they had made it with nearly twenty minutes to spare. He drove into town and said, "'Okay, where to?' "'There's something up ahead,' the old man said, and they drove another block into the quaint little town." A bar and grill sat right there on the main drag, its parking lot practically full. It had one of those lit-up signs with the plastic letters on it that read, Naughty or Nice? December 24th, Open All Night. The place was called The Landing Zone. I suppose we should pull in here, Gerald said, and there was practically giddiness in his voice. Douglas's eyes went to that sign with naughty or nice and a question mark on it. And suddenly, he wasn't so sure he wanted to be here anymore. Um, he muttered, maybe I should just drop you two off. Nonsense. You're here. You might as well. And then Gerald stopped, looking at Douglas's face. What is it? What you deserve. That was the thing right there. If everybody in this town really did get what they deserved, then what would that mean for him? Had he done everything right in his life? Or even this week? Of course not. His apartment would never want for office supplies. He absolutely loved profanity and wouldn't set foot in a church if his afterlife depended on it. 
He'd backed into a car at the Trader Joe's parking lot the week before and didn't stay or leave a note. And don't get started on his browser history. And, just the night before, he'd used his passed-out roommate's debit card to pay for pizza when it was totally his turn. Not terrible sins, no. But there were more where that came from. And what if they added up? Please, son, tell me what the problem is, Gerald asked, his warm hand on Douglas's wrist. I don't know what I deserve. Not a miracle, surely. You two may be better off on your own. Now don't say that. You brought us all this way. Stay and see what happens. I'm not sure. Well, I am. He pointed at himself. You think I've done everything right my whole life? My wife could tell you a story or two that that might make you kick me right out of your car. Douglas didn't believe it. But I've tried, especially since the cancer came back, to be a changed man, to be my best self. And I believe we'll both get what we need in there, all three of us. Bathed in Douglas's headlights, a man in a Santa Claus suit was crossing the parking lot and gave them a jolly wave. He then hopped into his Prius and backed out of a nearby spot. There you go, chuckled Gerald. Santa brought us a place to park. The sick woman made a sound in the back seat, and it might also have been a chuckle. Gerald stayed where he was, not sure what to do. Come now, don't let somebody else get the spot, urged his passenger. And that helped Douglas decide. If people in this town really got what they deserved then why were there so many cars in this parking lot? People were basically bad, and Douglas was, when he took a good look at himself, no better than they were, except for his boss at work. Now there was a giant asshole, the person who kept the balance so people like Tom Hanks could exist on the other end of the scale. Sko! The old woman gasped from behind him, and Douglas pulled into the spot, and killed the engine. Gerald patted him on the arm again. Put it out of your mind. I know good people when I see them, and I'm looking right at one. He opened the door. Music could be heard inside, and what he thought was a child's laughter, at just a couple of minutes before midnight. Doug, please help me get Samantha out and into the restaurant, the old man said and they were able to get her and her oxygen tank out with little effort. Her husband helped her get into the bar, while Douglas held the door. The place wasn't completely full, but it was close. Almost every table held a family or a couple, and they seemed abnormally cheerful for Christmas Eve, let alone any normal day of the week. There was a stage with a portly black man doing a jazzy rendition of sleigh bells on the karaoke machine, and a waitress hurried to greet them. She was tired-looking and perspiring, but gave them a smile and welcomed them to the zone. Did they want to be seated in the restaurant or the bar? Restaurant would be fine, Gerald spoke for them. She turned to lead them, but he said, Young lady. The lady in question was probably in her forties, maybe older, but she turned anyway. Did we miss it? Gerald asked, and Douglas saw the barest glimpse of despair in his eyes again, that expression he'd seen that made him turn around and pick him up more than an hour before. It? she asked. Then her eyes went to the dying woman by their side. It's not quite midnight, if that's what you mean. Well, uh, he stammered, unable to come right out and ask his question. He wants to know about the miracles, Douglas offered. The waitress's name tag read Lee. He heard people get what they deserve for Christmas here. She nodded. Guess there's no point in lying about it since you're here. That's tonight. A lot of people have already gotten their miracles, if that's what you want to call them. 
Santa was just here, handing out goodies. One or two was pretty impressive, actually. Such as? asked Gerald. The hopelessness was already departing. Some dork got his collection of Star Wars toys back, looking the same as when his mother threw them out, and one little boy got a new kidney in a styrofoam cooler. What, a, a real human kidney? Douglas asked, dubious. Yep. His dad's phone rang as soon as they saw it, with their doctor ready to perform the operation, holiday be damned. She snorted. Darned, I mean. You know what I'm saying. Well, something like that sounds pretty nice, Gerald said. Not that we could afford the operation. Need to sit, whispered Samantha, reminding both of them that she was short of breath and still standing. The waitress helped them to a table and asked if she could get them anything. She reminded them that, tonight, sodas and french fries were on the house. "'Well, thank you,' Gerald said, beaming, and asked for a ginger ale or Sprite. The waitress turned Douglas's way. Uh, "'Coffee, please,' he told her. "'And we'll take three of the club sandwiches. He could cover that much, at least. "'Only two, please.' Gerald corrected, smiling patiently at his wife. She smiled back. Apparently she wasn't up to food any more. All around them, people were applauding. On the karaoke stage, a pale, middle-aged woman approached the microphone, tears running down her cheeks, and began singing Oh Holy Night in an unremarkable but emotion-filled voice. People were rapt in watching her many of them crying, too. Lee, the waitress, leaned in. She came in five or six hours ago with her family. She lost her eyesight, was totally blind. And it's back now? Douglas all but shouted. A couple of the customers looked his way, but nobody yelled at him to keep it down. That's right. Guess she had that coming. Douglas gulped. But what about people who are, who don't have good things coming, that deserve whatever the opposite of a miracle is? Lee, the waitress, said, They get the hell, heck out of town. That's why it's been just me and one other girl working here all day. Bad folks are those with guilty consciences, tend to spend today in a motel room somewhere, just in case. But what might happen? Oh, I spilled coffee on a businessman last year. The pot just sprung a leak and doused the poor bass, the poor guy. He was real upset, but his wife told me she knew he'd been up to no good with his daughter's best friend. This just told her she was right. Welcome to Leah's Landing. All at once... Douglas wanted to get out of there. People at the tables nearby were cheering again. On the stage, the no longer blind woman was belting out the fall on your knees part of the song. I'm, uh, gonna head on over to the bar now, he told Gerald, standing up after having been sitting for less than a minute. Thank you for driving us, Doug, Samantha said from her seat and though her voice was strained, she was speaking above a whisper. Samantha? Is it happening? asked her husband. Well, I still feel like there's a horse on my chest, she managed. But at least it's not an elephant. Gerald laughed, taking her hand in his, and Douglas made a hasty retreat. He checked his phone. It wasn't quite midnight, but he didn't have time to get out of the restaurant, get in his car, and drive out of town before twelve o'clock. So he went to the bar and ordered a Jack and Coke. Sorry, gotta charge you for that, the bartender said. He was prematurely bald and bored-looking. There was only one other customer drinking at the bar, and he, an old man in a nice tweed suit, was drinking something that couldn't possibly have been alcoholic. Sure. Douglas said. The now-sighted girl finished her song and was replaced by a little kid 
up way past his bedtime, singing, All I Want for Christmas is My Two Front Teeth, a song Douglas hadn't heard in years. He wondered what his story was. Douglas sat down on a stool and winced. He'd completely forgotten about his incipient hemorrhoid problem over the last hour or so. The bartender got him his drink, then leaned in conspiratorially. You're not driving, are you? Guess not, Douglas said. He glanced at the bald head of the man and noticed new, dark stubble all over the guy's noggin. Maybe he just shaved it to look cool, but Douglas didn't think so. He took a sip of the drink, which was strong and not watered down. New cheers drew his attention from the main entrance. The man dressed as Santa had come in again, with a bulging green sack over his shoulder. He ho-ho-hoed and began walking up the aisles, looking for people he hadn't gifted yet. Every once in a while, he'd stop and reach into his bag, pulling something out at random, then giving it to a person. They'd thank him, and he'd move on. Douglas was curious about each and every package, especially when he stopped at Gerald and Samantha's table, and handed them two very small gifts. On the karaoke stage, an aged hippie type that looked like the bad guy in the Hunger Games movies started singing Another Old Lang Syne by Dan Fogelberg, which was not a Christmas song exactly, but was welcome because Douglas's girlfriend and he had danced to it at a New Year's work party the year before. Suddenly, he felt warm and nostalgic, happy to have had that relationship, even though it fell apart in the end, and wondered if that sensation he was feeling was what he deserved on this special night. He drank his drink, listened to the song, and only looked away when people at a nearby table were gasping and laughing at a dorky-looking twenty-something who had opened his gift from Santa and discovered an engagement ring in its box. He looked over at his friend sitting next to him and said, All right, then seemed to propose right then and there, though Douglas may have been reading it wrong. Ho, 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 the man dressed as Santa said, stepping right in front of Douglas. Hey, Santa, he said, and realized he was grinning at all this. Bet you've seen some things, huh? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. About an hour ago, I hand this woman a present. It's a pregnancy test. Already been peed on. Yuck. But she'd been trying to get pregnant for a long time, I guess. She took it the right way. How'd you manage that? Douglas wondered. I don't know. I don't question these things. He reached into his bag and pulled out a tiny, brightly wrapped package. He handed it over. Thanks. You gonna open it? Maybe later. Santa nodded. I gave a boy a kidney today. That would have made a believer out of anybody. Probably, Douglas said. The long-haired singer had just finished his song, and he lifted his now-empty glass to him. Oh, Santa said. Just gave some lady the keys to a new car. I didn't put it out there, but she pressed the button and it was right there in the lot next to where I parked. Douglas nodded, not quite believing that one, but unwilling to argue. You're not really Santa, are you? Of course not. My name's Joe, janitor in the middle school. But every year but one, I come here and hand out presents on Xmas Eve. He said it like X-Men, just to be weird. Every year but one. Santa shrugged. Eh, put sugar in the principal's gas tank that year. Blamed it on the kids. Figured it'd be best to stay with my brother in Temecula. Pretty smart, Douglas said. For something to say. Come on, open that up. Santa Joe said, pointing at the tiny gift. Harmonica, maybe. What? Douglas didn't play the harmonica, or any instrument, but he obliged and unwrapped the present. It was an extra-large pack of juicy fruit chewing gum, his favorite flavor. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Santa stared at the not-exactly-spectacular gift, 
for a full three or four seconds. Then he said, Huh, and continued on his way. Well, that was what Douglas deserved, it seemed. A nice song that brought back memories and enough gum to chew for the rest of the week. He supposed it could have been worse. His phone pinged in his jacket, alerting him to an email. But the man dressed as Santa wasn't done with him. Oh, and here, Santa said. Without further comment, he passed Douglas a white tube with a bow on it. More? Well, that's pretty j- It was hemorrhoid cream. Great. Just what he wanted. Or deserved. He looked over to thank Santa. Might as well. But he was busy with the other man at the bar who was looking at a photograph and crying softly. Santa Claus comforted him, and Douglas looked away. On the karaoke stage, an elderly woman started singing Santa Baby, shaking her hips like a geriatric hoochie dancer. Douglas didn't want to look at that either, and wondered if he should order another drink. Doug! An elderly voice called. Gerald was signaling him over to their table again. Douglas went over and joined them. There were three club sandwiches instead of two, an order of french fries, and some kind of off-white dipping sauce, along with a 7-Up and coffee. To his surprise, the old man threw his arms around Douglas and hugged him hard, like a Christmas traveler just off a plane. Douglas tried to look over at the old woman, but the hug just kept on going. "'You'll never guess what Santa brought us, Doug,' Gerald said in his ear. "'Was it a lung?' "'In a way, yes.' Samantha said from beside him, and her voice was normal and resonating. Gerald finally released him, and he looked at the old woman. She was a different person. She had been frail and emaciated before, with bags around her yellowing eyes. Now she looked fine, old, yes, but healthy as could be. She no longer had the tubes going into her nose, the oxygen tank sitting abandoned beside the table. "'You should have seen it,' Gerald said, shaking his head. "'Before my eyes, not only did her breathing improve, but her color, her weight, goodness, even her hair looks thicker.' "'And I'm hungry,' she said, "'for the first time in at least a year.' Douglas smiled. "'I wish I had been here to see that.' He didn't, really. That was an intimate, personal moment. That was for the woman and her husband alone, even though it might have been cool to witness. "'What's more?' Gerald said. "'Santa brought Sammy a set of car keys. They unlocked a Ford Explorer in the parking lot.' Douglas blinked. "'And you're just going to drive it away?' "'That's the plan. But where did it come from? Where's the paperwork?' What if it's stolen? Where did the other gifts come from? What if they're stolen? What did Santa give you? It doesn't matter. I just... Jer, tell him what Santa brought you, Samantha interrupted. Gerald sighed, then handed over a little green envelope, the same green as Santa Claus's bag had been. It held a lottery ticket. Arizona Gaming Commission, it said on it. We checked on the phone, Samantha boasted. It's a winner. How much? Too, Too much. much, both Gerald and his wife said at the same time. Then they laughed. Why Arizona? Douglas asked. We're from Arizona, Gerald proclaimed, as though that were the funniest part of all this. Thank you again, Doug, Samantha said and then she, too, was hugging him. He hugged her back. He knew he wasn't responsible for any of this, but he had played a part in it, and that was something. "'Sit down and eat with us,' Gerald said. "'Tell you what, I'll cover the check on this meal.' "'But you don't have any money,' Samantha said. "'I'm good for it,' he said, 
then laughed again. Nah, Douglas said. My sister will probably be worried. He remembered the email alert earlier and grabbed his phone from his jacket. The email was not from anyone he knew, but from somebody at Harper Collins Publishing. He opened the message. Oh, he said. Bad news, Gerald asked, exchanging a look with his wife that Douglas did not see. No. Douglas looked up. It's from an editor. He liked the art I sent him a few months ago. Wants to hire me to do the cover for Robin Hobb's new book. Robin Hood? Is that good? The old man's wife corrected him, and both waited for Douglas's response. He nodded. He was embarrassed to tell them how much the offer was for, but hey, they were apparently now millionaires, so it didn't feel like boasting. He found his cheeks reddening as he explained. Well, there you go, Gerald said, raising those monster eyebrows of his. Douglas shook his head. No, I... Words weren't exactly flying for him here. I don't think I deserve this. The old man's eyes smiled, even though he was already smiling with his mouth. He leaned in closer. Well, perhaps it's magic then, he said. All right, everybody. You know oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, you know what Christmas song I never grew up with, but I am sick to death of hearing this year in 2019... Which one? There's the one that goes, It's the holiday season. <laughs> From me to you, but not to Jews. Everybody <laughs> loves the, you know, he's like, uh -huh. and, and, and for some reason, every time I turn on the radio or every time I go into a store that is playing Christmas part, Christmas song, the part that is playing is the part where he says, And don't forget to hang the stock. And I just, it hurts my ears more every time that he says, hang the stock. I just, oh, oh, I hate it so much. Huh. Is that a song that you grew up with? No, I don't think, uh, I, I have, I think, a version that Frank Sinatra sings of that. And I think that may be the only version I've ever heard of it, to tell you the truth. Oh, well, nice yeah, it, it was probably, probably made famous by Sinatra, but, you know, one of those knockoff Sinatra artists like Michael Buble <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, Harry Connick Jr. 20 years ago. It's like every, into every generation, a new Sinatra is born. Right. They all have to cover that song. I don't know. It's interesting. I don't know that I've heard that one that much. The one that I have grown very sick of, um, but it has fallen out of favor suddenly because people have decided it's a rape song. Is... Ah, I know which one you're talking about. <laughs> it's cold outside. Yeah, baby, it's cold maybe outside. Maybe it's cold outside. I don't think I heard that for the first time until I was a complete adult. I was like 20, probably almost, probably 25 years old. I think I got Brian Setzer Christmas album, and Brian Setzer sang it with, what's her name, Anne Margaret? Oh, okay. Which I thought was weird because Anne Margaret has got to be, what, like 40 years older than Brian Setzer, probably? <laughs> Maybe not that much. Well, I don't know. But She's quite a much. ways older. I mean, she was the love interest in Grumpy Old Men by that time. I don't think Brian Setzer could have been one of the grumpy, at least 20 years older, we'll say. But yeah, it just was, it, it seemed weird to me that they were... Uh, romancing each other with that song but that was what seemed weird to me about the song then but now it was yeah, the age it's... discrepancy well the thing is i never heard that before I, I got you beat i was nearly 30 i think when i heard that song uh yeah i f was first introduced in the movie elf oh okay which everybody loves and i was just like how do these two characters know this song <laughs> um and then, yeah, then later everybody started making a stink about the song. And just this year, uh, I decided I would look it up and find out what the origin of this song was. And it turns out th that it's not a rape song at all. Yeah, it's not. That uh, 
the girl wants to spend the night, yeah. but society's mores say that she can't. Right. And so she's coming up with flimsy excuses. And then when she's about to give in to spending the night, she blames it on the drink. <laughs> At least that's how the, the song was originally intended. Yeah, yeah. It's, she, and, she wants to stay. She's trying to basically get this guy to come up with a good enough excuse that she can pass off the reason that she stays. And just because a, a roofie slipped into a drink exists, and so it sounds kind of funny when you hear somebody say, Say, what's in this drink? It's, it's one of those kind of things where people look at history with historically blind eyes. They just assume that everything has always been exactly at is, as it is now. And yeah, it's just kind of funny. Was it this year or last year where there was some radio stations were like, we're banning this song because it's rapey. Yeah. And then they got such a backlash from people that they're like, oh, uh, actually, we were just joking when we said that. I don't know why you guys thought we were serious. <laughs> <laughs> I guess because it became a thing, it got so prevalent. Everybody does it on their album, and so now there's a million versions of the song. When so many different people have done it, then, you know, the holiday music stations and whatever are like, well, we got six versions that we can play, so we're going to have to play it once every half hour. Oh, that sucks. You turn on Spotify, or, or I went to a place where they just had Spotify on the Christmas station, and so I think it's just random what it plays right but there are certain songs that there's 20 different versions of and so to your surprise you'll get like back to back songs <laughs> by two different artists or whatever and that yeah it just it happens because there's so many people doing this holiday standard but yeah your last episode you talked about you know getting older and uh becoming more curmudgeonly or whatever and and i yeah i certainly have become with the Christmas music. It's just every year they start earlier with uh, you know, we're making our transition to just playing Christmas music or, you know, normal stations, which I still hate, but I can accept. Every third song now is going to be a Christmas song. Right. Um, for some reason, I just get so much more tired of those songs than I do regular music. Well... Every year, you've heard them a few more times, so, you know, uh, every song gets old after you've heard it a certain number of times, you know what I mean? Like, you can only listen to time after time, uh, you know, maybe an amazing song and you love it to death, but once it's been number one for a few weeks and it's playing on the radio constantly, you start to tire of it, and that's why songs don't stay number one forever, you know, they fall back off of the charts, because... People have grown sick of them. With Christmas music, you at least get 11 months or 11-ish, 10 months off, I guess, per year before they come back. So it gives you a little time to build up a uh, resistance, a resilience. Uh, what's, the, what's the word for... <laughs> a when, tolerance. Yeah, build up a tolerance or uh, whatever it is when you, when you get the antibodies against it. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, it's going to start wearing it down because you, you do it again. I, I, I have had that same problem that you're talking about. You know, I've got my Christmas songs, you know, that are in my music library. And yeah, lots of times I have it where it plays because I just shuffle them all, all the time. You know, I just go to the songs and hit shuffle and listen to some songs for a while. And so many times where I get the same song, just a different version of the same song played back to back, I think a lot of it has got to do with the fact that there are, you know, most bands these days don't want to do any religious Christmas music. You know, religious music is the asking for it, I guess. People are going to be like, oh, I don't want to listen to that crap. I don't believe in that or whatever. And you're going to lose some of your audience at the very least. Uh, because of that. And I know that Bing Crosby himself didn't want to do Christmas music when they first suggested it to him. He's like, no, I'm not a religious singer. I'm a pop singer. I, I, I can't do this religious music, which is funny because Bing Crosby is considered the Christmas guy now. And, you know, the the album of his that I have, which has, I think, pretty much every Christmas song he ever did, is called The Voice of Christmas. Because that's what people consider him to be. But even he didn't want to do that. 
so I can understand it. But if you don't want to do that, then don't do Christmas albums. You know, you don't have to do a Christmas album. Uh, do a song or less. I don't know. It's just you guys all pick the same song. There's only so many non-religious Christmas songs to pick from. And now every album has them on it because of that. It just gets tiresome. You know, you, you, I think you and I have both complained about it because Sting is the exact opposite of that. Where instead he's like, but, but people know this Christmas song. I can't sing this song. They've heard it before. And so he would pick the most frickin' obscure songs you ever heard. <laughs> I believe Sting was quoted as saying, I will go and find a dead language that no one speaks anymore. <laughs> yeah. And I will use that song. His songs are so obscure that you listen to them and they don't, it doesn't even feel like a Christmas album because there's no like Jingle Bells in it and there's no... Uh, not just the song Jingle Bells, but there's no bells, you know? He doesn't even... <laughs> he makes sure to keep it from sounding Christmassy in any way. But yeah, all the songs are so... They don't feel like Christmas at all. So it's funny because I have that album too. And when it plays, I'm just like, huh. I should put the Christmas music back on. If people were a little more judiciously, you know, choosing stuff instead of just playing the same... Uh, Happy Christmas, War's Over, and uh, Last Christmas, and Baby It's Cold Outside, Sleigh Ride. You know, there's the certain songs that don't refer to the religious aspects of the holiday, and everybody picks them. And I guess, but it just makes it seem so repetitive after a while. And I even did that a little while ago. I took my Christmas list... Uh, my playlist and I went through and just kind of organized them by song title and then went through each song and tried to pick just one version of each song and delete all the rest so that I could stop getting these back-to-back -back versions of songs shuffled and it's hard though because you know I like this version I like that version I like that version so I want to keep them all but it gets annoying when they shuffle back-to-back -back like that but we should probably talk about your story, huh? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the story that you listened to 20 minutes ago. Yeah, I feel bad for whoever asked to edit this episode. Yeah, the poor chump. He's going to kill himself rather than do it. Uh, <laughs> so, the story was called What You Deserve. You know what it makes me think of for some reason? The title or the story? The story, it's, I mean, the premise, we'll say, uh, what it made me think of is our Broken Mirror story event where it was, you arrive in town to find that everyone is exactly the same or something like that. I don't know. It's just, uh -huh. it's, it's a town where something is off, something is weird, something is different, which is a thing that you like to do in stories, right? Yeah, I think it's my second favorite trope in writing stories. I just love that idea of going to a place where there is a tradition or there is a recurring supernatural event or where so just something is not right. I don't know what it is, but that is endlessly interesting to me. I don't mind writing a hundred different variations on that idea. You could do a collection that's all just based on this. You go to a town where things are not what they seem. Yeah, I think of Replacement Day. Is that what it was called? Replacement Day? Overtaken? Takeover Day? Takeover Day, that's what it was. Overtaken was the name of the story though, right? Yes. Yeah, I think of that one. Uh, I think of, heck, Chalupa Dale, <laughs> next exit. <laughs> Yes, Chalupa Dale next exit. Um, Everybody loves Chalupas. Yeah, you've done it several times. There was another one that was just on the tip of my brain and, and it has fled. Well, this year I've written several. <laughs> yeah. All about the bed and breakfast that is haunted. Oh, okay. One day a year. Right. It's yeah. just, yeah, I don't know if, if the audience is tired of it, but I am not. <laughs> so. so, F them. Well. <laughs> Yeah, it is a fun, a fun premise. You know, it's something that you know. It's like we were saying with our premise for our Christmas story. You know, we picked the premise that we're going with this year because it was wide open. You could take it in a lot of different ways. 
you are invited to your girlfriend's or boyfriend's uh, right house for uh, Christmas dinner, and the meal does not go exactly as planned or is not what you expected. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you can do with something like that that's kind of vague. And I think that this, something about this town is different. Oh, that's the other one that I was thinking of, the, the town where the girl goes to, to stay with, like, her family uh, because she's a, a troubled teen. So they send her with to live with the really religious. Yeah, and she thinks that they're family. just weirdly religious, but no, the vice is coming. Yeah, we could sit and talk about... All the different stories I've written that have that uh, sort of premise. I even had Gino make up a book cover for me one time that would be called Murder Town and Other Stories by Rish Outfield. And it was all going to be about the small town that is not, you know, what it seems or that has some unique attribute to it. Mm -hmm. There are many, many more where those came from, I'm sure. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, so how did you come up with this particular quirk for your town? Everybody on Christmas Eve gets what they deserve. Oh, shoot, I don't know. I, I don't have an answer for you on that at all. It was written last Christmas, and... You were busy giving uh, someone your heart. But, you know, guess what happened the, the next... The very next day they threw it away. Okay, well, there you go. Yeah, I, I must have called and drunkenly complain to you about this happening because yeah you remember it almost word for word uh but this year to save you from drunken phone calls <laughs> i'm going to give it to someone special it's a good idea i don't know where the story came from i have dumbly picked up hitchhikers before um oh. or offered to give people rides in the past and so far it's never backfired you um, are still I, I, with us to podcast, so it hasn't backfired am, at least yeah, badly. But, <laughs> but last year, uh, I did have a guy approach me at Walmart and ask where I was going and if he could, if I would give him a ride to his house. And I, I told him yes, and, and I drove him to his house. Uh, and this was at like 2 in the morning on a Tuesday night that he, he approached some stranger. The whole time I was just like, this guy's going to steal my car at the very least and murder me at the, you know, whatever the opposite of that is. Uh, why did I do this? Why, why would I be so stupid as to, you know, help somebody, you know, who needs help? <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he didn't end up killing me or anything. I, I dropped him off at his house, but there was this point right before and do you do you remember where the story is going do you remember me calling you and telling you about this i i remember you telling it but i don't remember how it finished so go ahead it'll be a surprise to me again okay so we were we got off the the freeway exit and we we're going to his neighborhood which i was not familiar with and at some point he said hey rish thank you thanks a lot i really appreciate this oh, that's right and for the rest of the drive I was like, he just said my name. This guy just said my name, and I did not give him my name. I don't give people my name, ever. It used to piss my dad off. Why didn't you tell him what your name is? Is there something wrong with your name? <laughs> and I just don't. I don't give people my name, and uh, yet he used it. And so for the rest of the trip, I was thinking, did I imagine that? What could he have said that I interpreted as my name, I I don't know, and it it felt like some kind of supernatural weird thing, you know, mm -hmm. like I had picked up a ghostly hitchhiker or something, <laughs> and, and I dropped him off at the house, and he thanked me, and then I went home, and yeah, it it cost me seven minutes or something like that, uh, but nothing else. It was just you know I gave this guy a ride home, and he turned out to be a normal guy, but I certainly had to have been thinking about it when I came up with this story and i don't know why i said it in northern california or m mid california <laughs> i i don't yeah i don't really know anything about where the story came from other than that that i had picked up an, a hitchhiker and driven him home <clears throat> and it could have gone badly but it didn't and so i think i just yeah i came up with a a story where a guy you know, what would the circumstances be where you would you would not be able to say no 
And so, yeah, I just, I think I just loaded it on a little bit more and more with, you know, how sick the wife was and how uh, nakedly desperate the old man is. Right. And so, yeah, he, he goes to this strange town to indulge this old guy and uh, he's rewarded for it. You know, it, he goes to a magical place and uh, magical things happen. And originally, all he was going to get was the hemorrhoid cream. That was going to be <laughs> the punchline of the joke because it was going to be like those stories that I tell you that I write where it's a massive F you at the end. Uh -huh. I've written several of them and I've told you, you know, I don't know if the audience is going to like this ending, but who cares? <laughs> F them. Which is just, yes, a wonderful thing. I sound like George R. R. Martin or something, don't I? Yeah. Uh, with, the, the, with the respect and love I have for my fervent audience. But it's just, yeah, that was how the story was going to end. So I set it up that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. he had this particular uh, unpleasant problem. But, you know, as I was writing it, I said, okay, well, I'm going to have the karaoke guy sing a song that reminds him of better days, and he feels nostalgic about it, and that's kind of nice. And then I piled on another nicety, and then I remember, and this was last December, I called you and I said, okay, what's a fantasy author that this guy could get a gig doing the cover for? Yeah. And, I do remember that. And you named like well. two or three, and they were all long dead. <laughs> and I was like, uh, do you know anybody that may be still writing? And yeah, you said Robin Hobb. And I, I'd never heard of Robin Hobb, sadly. Uh, but I, I, I looked him up and found out that it's not a man. And uh, <laughs> I was just like, oh, okay, there you go. That's whose cover he got the gig to paint. And yeah, I keep meaning to sit down and read a Robin Hobb book just because of, I mean, in a roundabout way, you introduced me to her, uh -huh. but I still haven't new, done it. Your newfound connection to her work. Yeah. But yeah, I think, I think that's it. I just, I wanted the, there to be a happy ending for the, for the old man and the, the old woman. And maybe that's too schmaltzy, but again, I don't care. I wrote the story that I wrote and uh, Gerald's reward was going to be that he felt good and now he has a cool story to tell but you know i ended up rewarding him anyway it's just I, he does a lot for this couple right really it's one of those where i i don't know how believable it is maybe the story belongs like on the hallmark channel except for it's not <laughs> it's not cookie cutter enough uh -huh. it's not exactly the same as every single other hallmark channel Christmas story. But yeah, it's the story that I wrote and I, I feel like it's it's fairly benign and uh, cheery and sweet. And uh, I've got my uncle that's a Mennonite and he's super, super conservative, like ridiculously so. And the main character is named after him, my uncle Gerald, Jerry. Mm -hmm. And yeah, while I was recording this for our show, I thought, oh, I should send this to him. I think he would... No. No, he wouldn't. <laughs> but yeah, there you go. That's all I can really think of to say about the background of this story. Lots of times I don't know where things come from. I'm right. not as bad as Stephen King where he's like, yeah, it's, it's Tommy Knock is I, I wrote it. Well, that's it, Steve. Well, I, I don't even remember that I wrote it. But I was, I was doing drugs. I was and so uh, high. Then there, and then the royalty checks started coming in. <laughs> <laughs> and I went and cashed them to buy more drugs. I really don't know anything else. <laughs> yeah. But writing is kind of like that in a way where I go to another place. Another place in time. Yeah. I, I'm not going to go as far as to say that it's magical, but it is kind of a mysterious thing that when you explain to someone else, they are either wide-eyed and it's like, ooh, or they, they refuse to believe that, and they're just like, oh, okay, well, that no, where did you really come up with this story? It's rare that a story just comes to me. Yeah. But this one was somewhere in between. I think it was just sparked by my experience, and then I wanted to write a nice Christmas story. Uh, just like you, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting old enough to where, you know, the bad guys don't always have to win. 
Oh, okay. I'm remembering the the story, the the Ouija board Christmas story that we ran a few uh-huh. years ago. That was another one of those big F U endings, <laughs> where it's just like, and then it ends this way. F you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and that's what the hemorrhoid cream was going to be for Gerald. I don't know. If you're, if you're listening to it, you can tell me whether you would have preferred the original ending or whether you like a nicer ending for the guy. I think it sometimes depends, you know, how much you uh, are led along the garden path. You know what I mean? Like, how long does this trail go? And this story turned out to be, what, like almost an hour long? Yeah, it wasn't quite as long as yours, but it, it was long. So, you know, when you put that much time into something, and I remember Stephen King, you know, I was just listening to his on writing book recently, and he talked about the writing of misery. And originally, yeah, the the lady who takes the author uh, prisoner, this was supposed to just be his, like, in-between books, short story slash novella that he was going to write. And, yeah, the lady that takes the author prisoner was going to have her own special uh limited edition. edition yeah limited edition bound with the author's own skin uh <laughs> because she was yeah, gonna... it was going to be a richard bachman story or book yeah and yeah it was going to end that nastily and, and he said that you know he kept uh writing and his his character the author turned out to be more resilient than he expected and he kept managing to find ways to stay alive and find ways to keep this story going. And, and then he realized at a certain point, he's like, oh, crap, this has gone on too long for me to end the story the way I had originally planned. Now I'm going to have to find a way to get him out of this. And, yeah, that's kind of the same, I would say, in the case of this story. You, know, you don't want to go for an hour leading people, you know, telling them all this stuff and you know, the whole story and then just be like, okay, and F you, thanks for, thanks for sticking around all that time. F you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, once they've been around for that long, you're like, oh, well, shoot. Now I owe them a good ending. And so you do huh. a little bit more. I don't know. It, it, it feels like that might be uh, something. I mean, at the very least, you did give us some other, you know, like he, he became very nervous there near the end where he's just like, no, I don't, I don't want to be here. I don't, uh, I've done this, I've done that. You know, he started uh, listing off some, some of his various sins that he had uh, participated in uh, recently. And it started you wondering, okay, yeah, is this guy going to be the one who, instead of getting his eyesight back, loses his eyesight? Uh, he gets the box from Santa, and there's a knife in it, and it jumps straight into his eyeball. I started to wonder if something like that might happen. And then I thought it was just kind of funny when he gets a pack of Juicy Fruit. <laughs> Which, yeah, I, don't know, I guess... I don't know where that came from, except for I think I looked up a kind of gum that is no longer available. Oh, anyway, is it go, not go, available go anymore? Oh, I was going to say that, yeah, you could say that it ended badly because Juicy Fruit is the worst gum. <laughs> it's, I don't know if you remember Juicy Fruit, eating it when you're a kid, but the flavor lasted all of like two minutes. You'd bite into it and it tasted great and it was gone. And then it was just like chewing rubber. And so like the great big pack of Juicy Fruit, you know, you'd eat one stick but you'd be done with the whole pack in like five minutes because you have to keep shoveling in sticks just so that it had flavor. And people would have just a giant wad of juicy fruit in their mouth because they actually ate like 10 sticks of gum instead of one. Uh, unless, you know, you're just trying to work out your jaw or something, you know, and so you, you just needed something in your mouth to constantly chew on that has no flavor at all. Well, you could certainly do a version of this story where... Like you said, what what the person deserves is not good. And, and I'm not going to write a sequel to it, but I'm already coming up with an idea of what, how somebody could use their knowledge of what happens Christmas Eve of this town, you know, for, for revenge or for justice purposes kind of thing. Uh-huh. But yeah, I didn't want to write that dark of a story. And Gerald really is a good person. Yeah, and that's the other thing that, you know, we don't really know. 
uh, what the deal is with that guy. You know, he's, he's kind of weird. He's always oh, he believes in magic. He's, oh, great. What have I picked up? Uh, you could have probably gotten away with something like that if you wanted to. Just make uh, something really bad happen to those people. And then you find out. Like maybe the wife is healed or something and then she tells you, oh yeah, this guy did this or that or this or, you know, <laughs> so I don't know. It just, uh, it does have a lot of possibilities. Uh, I guess this story itself, you know, you could write many versions of it, uh, just like the many things that are happening at the bed and breakfast. Well, there, like I said, I, I don't plan on writing a sequel, but there's already ideas for one. <laughs> and it, but it wouldn't involve Gerald. It would just be another... Right. Another person that shows up that day or the next year or whatever. I know that Dean Wesley Smith had a Christmas story series where he did something kind of like that, where, you know, every year... I think it was a jukebox. He had, like, a magic jukebox and... You would play a song on the jukebox, you know, that you remembered from another time in your life. And the magic jukebox would transport you back in time to a different time when you were listening to that same song. And then you could do something different. Fix, right the wrong, or make the, other deci- the right decision instead of the wrong one. Or something like that. And he had a series where, yeah, they would do that each time. His character would find somebody that needed something to make their life better. And then he would bring them to his bar on Christmas Eve. And they would get a record out and listen to it on the jukebox. And it would take them back in time. Wow, that's a really solid uh, idea for a story. For a series of stories. I think I listened to it once. uh, One of his, or listened to, I read one of his stories once. I don't think he does podcasts. But yeah, I I read one of his versions of that. And it was pretty good. And, uh, you know, I could see that uh, selling. (laughs) And, uh, you know, he talks a lot about selling. That's kind of his thing, is he's, he's the uh, business writer, teacher guy. I, tr- I try to go to him when I finally get ambition enough to feel like I could be somebody. I may be getting, uh, you know, if I keep this writing up, uh, my plan uh, for this year has been to write the whole year through. You know, I've done several times where I've done a month, where I wrote every day or even two or three months where I wrote every day, but I always wind up giving up and falling on my face. And yeah, this past year on my birthday, when when I turned 45 years old, I decided, you know what? This year is going to be the year where I write the whole year through. And I haven't written every day. That uh, was not necessarily my plan. The plan was to write a lot the whole year through, or nearly every day the whole year through. I didn't expect to write every day because there's always something that comes up. And if you make your goal that you have to do it every day, the second you miss one, you're done. The goal is lost and you might as well quit. So I didn't want that to be the, uh, the idea. So instead, yeah, it was just I write a lot and the goal was to get to 300,000 words in one year. I'm getting there. This month was supposed to be 500 words a day. I was doing very well with it until my father passed away and uh, I went uh, a little over a week without writing a thing. But yeah, back to it and yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm getting, starting to get excited, uh, really get into the idea of being able to be a writer and to really get things out there. I guess we had, what, three episodes in a row that were my stories before we had this episode today? Yeah, crazy, huh? And I plan on keeping on pushing it. I have given up on my toy show, so that's a lot of time, I guess, that I got back because of that. And I am going to invest that in other ways. And one of those ways will be getting my stories onto the podcast. So you will hear more of them. And I will continue to annoy and bug Rish Outfield, so you'll hear more of his stories, too. He already puts out tons of stories. If you don't listen to the Rish Outcast folks, you should, because Rish puts a lot of his stories on there for you to uh, listen to and enjoy, and that's awesome. And if you're not a Patreon supporter of the Rish Outcast, you should do that, too. Well, I'm not going to argue. 
<laughs> with that yes they should so yeah you should check that out at patreon.com forward slash rish outfield because you know rish deserves it man this is a good story and uh right now it's the only way really that you can uh patronize rish outfield or you could go to amazon right and buy your story outright yeah a lot of times i'll put them out that way i was thinking of doing an uh collection of uh Christmas stories uh-huh. because I haven't put them in any of my other collections. I always thought the Christmas ones belong in their own kind of thing. Right. I haven't done that yet. I'll have to get Gino to do me a drawing of Christmas tree that has skulls on it instead of ornaments <laughs> or something. I, I I don't know. But yes, if if they want to grab stuff on Amazon, that they're, they're more than welcome. Yeah, that would be cool. You should definitely do a a Christmas collection. I was actually thinking that. I'm starting to get to the point where I might be able to do my own Christmas collection here. I've got a a few stories that we've put out on the show. Uh, so Yeah. I, th- you, I think you have at least five. Yeah, something like that. I know that you have more than that many. We've done several of them, and I know you have more that we haven't done. That uh, would be very cool. Uh, I think that is a fun market to take advantage of. Anyways, uh, all right. Is there anything else you want to say before we finish up? No, no, I, I uh, feel like we've gone too long as, it's, as it is. <laughs> All right, well, then we will let everybody go on their way uh, and have a happy holiday. It's probably Christmas Day by this point. So thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you enjoyed the story. And I hope you enjoyed 2019. We'll be back again with you next year with some more fun and excitement. Wow. Okay, that, that's a lot to live up to, but uh, yes, uh, I hope that uh, the listeners get better than they deserve. Yeah. In this new year. Okay, everybody, see you later. I'm Big Ankovich. And I've been Rish Outfield. Good night. To all, a good night. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. That's what she said. Take two. Uh, was written by Mr. Rish Outfield. Uh, in case you were unaware of that beforehand. I'm talking about talking to you, sir. <laughs> yeah, sorry. My mom is calling on the other line, and so I didn't know what to do. <laughs> you want to answer it? Should I? Yeah, go ahead. That will ruin our recording. It's okay. Just answer it, take care of it, and then we'll finish, finish up when you're done. I'm in the parking lot of the store. What is it that you need? Big English cucumber. Still there? It says, it says you're on hold. You still there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, she needs me to pick up cucumbers and apple juice before I come home. Cucumbers and apple juice. Those go great together. Yep. That's a, a uh, snack s- I've had so many times I couldn't count it. Oh, that breeze feels so good. (laughs) Um, But it has fallen out of favor suddenly because people have decided it's a rape song. Ah, I know which one you're talking about. Oh, there's something to cut out. (coughs) I breathed wrong. (laughs) Apparently the little creature was closing my mouth. Yeah. And my nose. Um. I feel like that beeping sound tells us it's time to go. Uh, no, that was just me. Uh, somebody turned on their lawnmower nearby, so I thought I'd better roll my windows up. Uh, hold on one second, though. On the other line, let me... Uh... Hi. 
Uh, in the driveway. I'm ta- I'm doing my podcast. Yeah, I'm I'm sitting in one of them. I'll be in uh, soon. We're almost done. Okay. Bye. Okay. Sorry, I'm back. Oh, you are. Okay. Well, never mind. Let me uh, repark. I was going to run over to the grocery store and see if I could get the food in time. I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine.